Okay, so uh, I would like to introduce so uh, Professor uh, Lisbeth uh, Lisbeth Garris. So uh, she's a professor in um, in, the, in the department or, uh, of biomechanics and computational uh, tissue engineering at the University of uh, of Liège in in Belgium, and uh, she is also. Uh, She's also working at the Prometheus, uh, the Prome Prometheus uh, division uh, that is part of uh, the Catholic University of, of Leuven, so where they have a strong interaction with, with clinicians. So Lisbeth has a very strong expertise in uh, building models in order to assess precise clinical questions and then um, uh, so to, to, to calibrate uh, those models so from, uh, from experiments that are directly derived uh, from the clinical uh, experiments. So, Liz? Thank you, Jerome. That's uh, a lot to make, uh, <laughs> to, to, to cram into one uh, hour of uh, talk, but I'll try to live up to the expectations. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this does not seem to be working. So. I'm staying in the musculoskeletal system as uh, Jerome was doing, but I'm slightly shifting clinical perspective. So whereas Jerome was looking at the intervertebral disc and all the problems related uh, to back pain, we're working uh, in the field of tissue engineering. And this slide is basically all the justification that we need to tell you why we are doing uh, tissue engineering. It shows you just for the US alone, um, the problem, the clinical problem that is arising in the need for uh, donor organs or for new organs to treat patients. You see in green the number of donors, in brown the number of transplants, because every donor can have multiple uh, organs that can be transplanted, but in gray you have the number of people on the waiting list. And this is not just for, your, you know, the organs that everybody thinks about, like heart and lungs and liver, but also for bone. So uh, in bone tissue engineering, this is also part of our problem that we try to save, uh, to, to work on. Now, just a few words on bone for those who do not know it yet. So for those who do, it's just one slide. Bone is an intelligent material. It has sensors. It can adapt to its surroundings, to, its, to the loading um, that it experiences. And it is capable of healing, even scarless healing in the right conditions. Um, so it looks like it has, nature has it all solved, but in 5 to 10% of the cases, there is still a problem. There is a non-union, which probably has a lot of underlying uh, causes. And at some point, you will not die from bone that is not breaking, but you will become very much incapacitated. You might lose a limb, which has a very big economic uh, impact on society and on your own life. The problem specifically that we're working on with, the, the patient population that we're developing our, our, our uh, treatments for, is the patients are children with neurofibromatosis. In Dutch, the title reads, um, she has been walking around for 16 months with a broken leg. That was taken when she was about two years old, and finally she had surgery when she was four and a half years old and the leg was still broken. Um, so this is, this is the pathology that we're not specifically working on because it's a a big uh, pathology, it has a lot of uh, symptoms and one of them is musculoskeletal, but this is a specific patient population that is termed in, in orthopedic terms the orthopedic nightmare because there is no treatment and, uh, and a lot of times these children end up losing their limb. So what we want to do is actually come up with a tissue engineering strategy so that in the end when we treat those children that we will be able to give them when they have finally surgery, when they're big enough to undergo the surgery, that we can implant a living implant, uh, a piece of bone of about three centimeters that will help close the gap uh, and that we will be healthy tissue and not the diseased uh, bone tissue that they had uh, at the site of the fracture. So tissue engineering, I think everybody is more or less familiar with the definition. It basically comes down to wanting to create a living implant, one that can really integrate into the body and become functional uh, once it's integrated. Now, the problem with tissue engineering at this point is that there is, um, well, the, the wording is all chosen wrong. We are not really engineering things at the moment, or many groups are really doing just trial and error, so there is very little engineering apart from the biomaterial side and the, and the bioprocessing side. Um, and also the tissue definition is slightly uh, fuzzy in tissue engineering itself. So we believe in our group that 
engineers really have more to do in tissue engineering, a bigger role to play in tissue engineering. And that can be uh, in terms of uh, quantifying and optimizing products, processes, and in vivo responses. And one of the ways to do that, of course, in our opinion, is using computational modeling. And ideally, uh, we have, in our group, we have the experimental people, the clinical people, so we would be able to do all of the questions and all of the models in this nice uh, iterative, uh, integrative scheme where you have a question, you have a model, you analyze a model, you do the experiment and so on and you get more insight. Now, before I start, I want to make a few preliminary remarks. One of that is that the research that you will be seeing is not just from one of my students or just from one of, just my team alone. This is really a larger consortium that was needed um, to do that work. So, these are the people that in some way or another are involved. Not necessarily all of them directly in the research that you will be showing, but by simply being together, you get some influences from the experimental researchers and you learn uh, to, to look at problems in a different way. So the way we are structured in our group is we have, we start with the basics, the ground substances on the left hand side. So the cells, the growth factors and the materials. We have people working on those subjects specifically. And then we have people looking into mechanisms of action. So when I put all of that together, I put it in the body, what happens? And then uh, a bunch of people are responsible for trying to translate this to the clinic. So translating means both technology transfer, which is the bioprocessing part, and then the clinical transfer, which is the clinical, that preclinical uh, work. And at the bottom, going over all of these uh, other boxes, you have the enabling technologies. And those are imaging, uh, modeling, nanotechnologies and, and data management. Now, even if it looks all nice and dandy and well integrated, developing a common language is still difficult. Blanca already indicated, and, and I think James yesterday also mentioned it, the experiments that you need as a modeler are not always so very interesting for the biologists. So it is still, and after 10 years, it still remains tricky and a challenge to get those data that you need and to come up with experiments where the modeler can get uh, interesting things and that are at the same time also useful um, for biologists. Now, if you have that problem in your group, I can recommend this paper, Can a Biologist Fix a Radio? Very importantly, this has been uh, written by a biologist. This actually, in a very funny way, um, indicates why it is useful to have a model or a common language um, to discuss biological problems. Um, and the third uh, preliminary remark is that in this presentation I will just be talking about examples and I will not go into the details and the nitty-gritty of every one of the, the models um, that I will be showing. But we did do go through the whole uh, modeling loop as um, establishment and then the selection parameter optimization, sensitivity analysis and then trying to learn more about the model. Um, Blanca already mentioned a number of techniques, like um, she, she talked about Bayesian for the uncertainty. There is way more indeed to do. There is a sloppy parameter analysis, as she indicated. Jerome already talked about the design of experiments. So all these kinds of things uh, have their place in the model development cycle. And we just edited the book, and this is a bit publicity for myself, uh, on all of these different techniques that you could use uh, in order to complete such a, a model cycle. So, back to tissue engineering. What I want to show today are actually four different uh, examples, four categories of problems, not necessarily clinical problems, but also biological uh, problems, where we try to give or answer some questions um, by using or by developing a model. And those are the four C's uh, that we work on, so the cells, the carriers, the culture, and then finally, uh, the clinics. So starting with the cells, the first thing you need to know is when you look at uh, tissue engineering uh, or developmental engineering, as we now call it, to have a more biomimetic approach, is that we use biology as an inspiration, as the example of what we want to do. And most of the bone in biology, in our body, is developed through something called endochondral ossification. Uh, where you have the formation of well, cells coming together, then they form this, uh, this is the top half of a bone, um, where they form this condensation. And then in this condensation, you will get differentiation to chondrocytes, to hypertrophic chondrocytes. You get the growth plate, uh, or sorry, you get uh, the primary ossification center. 
you see here bone forming, and then you get the same thing happening again at the ends of the bone, which is creating then ultimately uh, the growth plate here in between. And so we believe that if we can recapitulate this endochondral ossification process, so going through a cartilage intermediate to ultimately uh, form bone, that we will have more robust and better uh, outcome in biology. And there have been some proof of concept experimental uh, papers to, to kind of underline or, or give power to that uh, assumption. So now what are the questions? If we want to go, if we want to take our stem cells and we want to drive them into the chondrogenic lineage. Now, the, you have cells here that are stem cells that are at the top of this kind of energy landscape. And when you give them a push, be it a chemical or a mechanical or an electrical push, they will start rolling down uh, into the valleys of this landscape. So they will start differentiating. Now, the question is, uh, where are my cells in this landscape? Is it still a stem cell? Is it really a chondrocyte? Is it something in between? Is it already on its way out? Um, and how stable is that state? So am I really sitting here nicely in a valley like this? Or am I actually in between two valleys? That is a situation that you don't want because if you're in between two valleys and you implant the cell like that in the body, well then it might decide to go back to that side what you expected, where you expected it to be, or it might roll to the other side. So instead of producing bone, you might actually end up with stable cartilage, which is not what you want. So we need to understand how we can push cells into a certain state, and once they're there, how we can keep them there, because those are two uh, separate questions. Now, the way we do that is by looking at the regulatory networks of these cells. And there are very different ways, uh, many ways to, to have a model of such a regulatory network. And if you just, in most papers, you will find something like this, a graph that is connecting uh, with arrows, the different players that the people uh, were interested in. But you can go all the way from this graph, you can add interactions. So you can actually model over time um, and quantitatively the, the, the interactions between the different players. And you can go so from a very phenomenological model all the way to a mechanistic model where you put values on all the different steps. In our case, with the endochondral ossification or with the growth plate, what you see here is a simplified version of the network that is representing the chondrogenic differentiation uh, within the growth plate. So you have growth factors uh, that are here in blue you have a number of um, transcription factors, and then you have uh, other proteins that are involved, like the yellow ones, which are the matrix proteins, um, that are involved in this whole process. Two important ones are SOX9, which is representative of a chondrocyte, and RUNX2, which is representative of a uh, hypertrophic chondrocyte, which then will ultimately induce uh, bone formation. So how does it work uh, if, we go, if we use one of these models? So let's start with the simple Boolean model. In a Boolean model, what you do is you say, all my, all my genes are either on or off, one or zero. And they can interact by say, having an additive or, a, or an, uh, a negative effect. So they can, you can have an end function, um, an or function, or a non function. So basically what happens is with this kind of networks, you, st you induce your network by starting with putting one certain genes on and other genes off. And then you look at the interaction. So if A and B are necessary to, to, have, to upregulate C, as long as A and B are zero, C will always be zero. But once A and B are one, C will also become one. So when you start by initializing this, this is very well possible that you need, you have changed the network, so you have put things on that will induce the upregulation, for instance, the next step of other uh, genes in the network. So you in initialize a Boolean model and then you go through step by step until you actually re reach a state where no matter how many steps you have the model take, it will always return the same result. That is a stable state. So we initialized the network with just the, the some some of the markers for uh, chondrocytes like SOX9 and then what we ended up with is a number of genes and gray is one uh, and, and white is zero a number of a combination of genes that is reminiscent of a resting zone uh, chondrocyte so before it actually uh, participates in the growth plate or moves towards the growth plate when you then change something 
And in this case, that was the Indian hedgehog. That is a signal that normally comes from outside, from the perichondrum, so from the boundaries of the growth plate. Um, when you change that, when you put that on, then the network starts evolving again until it reaches a, for, a, a second stable state, which is that of the proliferative chondrocyte. You see that because you have SOX9, uh, which is upregulated. Um, black is actually two, so it's kind of a multi-level Boolean. Um, black is two, so SOX9 is expressed and RUNX2 um, is not expressed. Then we move further and physically in the growth plate, the cells are migrating down. So at some point you lose the PTHRP, which also comes from the side. And then you see that the network evolves to a final stable state. And that is actually uh, reminiscent of the uh, hypertrophic uh, layer of the chondrocytes. You pass in between through a state where RUNX2 and SOX9 uh, are both uh, present. And that is actually the, the pre-hypertrophic uh, state, but that is not a stable state. That's simply a transition zone uh, because you have a physical distance between the proliferative cell layer here and the hypertrophic cell layer here. This is just another representation of that. In black, you have the results from our model. Um, and in pinkish, you have the results from the literature. So what we cannot have is gradients, of course, because, well, we have just one cell that represents a certain uh, layer. And what, um, but you see that it's kind of uh, over uh, matching. So with what we can conclude from that, or what we concluded from that, is that with the set of genes we had in the network, we were able to, rec uh, to recreate or capture some of the uh, essential behaviors of a growth plate chondrocyte. Now, the problem was that with this Boolean model, you're either on or off, and there is no time. So we have genes, we have proteins, and these actions, they're at different time levels. And in a Boolean model, there is no concept of time. So everything happens just as fast. So um, the, the, you have the phosphorylation, phosphorylation and um, the transcription all happen at the same time level, which is not the case in reality. So we uh, made a new uh, model framework, which is an additive model. Um, which still sits between zero and one, so, but it's in continuous ways. So your gene can be anywhere between zero or one or your protein, and you have fast processes and slow processes. So for every box that you saw in the network, we actually have two values. One represents the gene, the other one represents the protein. And then there can be interactions between the gene level and the protein level. And the proteins will uh, be much faster than the, the, the transcriptional uh, part. Um, so the proteins will first be uh, equilibrated and only then we will take a next step uh, in the mRNA. Now, the, um, we tested again that network by doing a number of analyses and these are typically canalization. So you initialize your network 100,000 times with different combinations of values and then you see where it goes to. And we had three attractors, which is a non-state, which represents either apoptosis or something that is not in the scope of the model. We have uh, a RUNX2 state, uh, sorry, a SOX9 state, and a RUNX2 state. And so you can see from the 100,000 analysis how many go to a RUNX2 state, how many go to a SOX9 state, how many go to a non-state. And that tells you something about um, this, the attractor basin of uh, certain genes or certain states. You can do a perturbation where you basically start from I'm in a SOX9 state and then I get a push. Uh, one of the, the growth factors in the network is upregulated and then you see whether I go to another state or I stay in my state. So that tells you something about the stability uh, under perturbation of this network. Um, one of the things that we were able to do with the additive network that we weren't able to do with the Boolean network is to have those effects. What you see here is uh, results for increasing doses of the growth factors that are mentioned here. So for the gro four growth factors, you see what is the response of the network under increasing doses of these growth factors. And here I have to say, we start with all the models that will end up, or all the combination of parameters that will end up in a SOX9 attractor. And what you see here is for all these combinations of initial states, what happens if I increase the doses? So for BMP, what happens is uh, when I increase the doses, at some point, part of the initial states will not, no longer lead to a SOX9 state, but to a, a, a non-state. Whereas for IGF-1, uh, for instance, 
it happens that the SOX9 uh, attractor is decreasing, so the, the, the height of the SOX9 expression is decreasing, and then at some point, if you increase IGF-1 further, you exit the, the SOX9 attractor entirely. So those are things, they might seem a little bit abstract, but we tested this on, for instance, a network for T helper cells, and we were able, by having this uh, difference in time uh, resolution, we were able to reach steady states that we were not able to reach if you just had a pure Boolean model. So, um, and those states actually did exist. So Boolean models were not able to get there, but these models uh, were, the, the additive framework was able to get there. And at the same time, it still had the simplicity of not having any parameters. So all the interactions, they are added, but there is no weight that is assigned. Now, how are we using this? Um, we, are, we have done this uh, uh, big study where all of these uh, boxes in the network, we upregulated and we downregulated and then looked at their effect on the size of the attractor basin for RunX2 and SOX9. The way you use this is, for instance, by saying, um, if I here upregulate the FGF uh, R3, so the, the receptor 3 of FGF, then I will induce the RunX2 state. So I will lose my SOX9 state and I will increase the uh, attractor basin for the RunX2. So likely my culture will end up in a RunX2 positive state. But at the same time, you see if you um, downregulate FGF R3, nothing really happens. So you ha have no effect. So you can induce a state, but you cannot use the FGFR3 to keep the cell in that specific state. For that, you will then need to add other things to your culture medium. Um, then we had to validate in some way this model. And that was a bit problematic because by chain, swift, uh, shifting from the Boolean to the additive framework, we couldn't use some of the basic um, tools for validation of the network that, that Jerome, like Jerome already mentioned, uh, that were developed by Mendoza and others, because we no longer fitted those definitions. So we had to come up with another way, but it's so complex that you cannot just intuitively look at, at does, is it right or not? So we developed a number of things. We, we are doing a number of things. One is an ensemble approach. So we tried to see all the different combinations that would fit the data and extract some commonalities from that and test them in the lab. Another one is inference. So we took the data-driven approach. We looked at uh, microarray studies that were published in the literature. And then we tried to infer the network from that. And because we didn't really have a strong preference for any of the, of the available uh, bioinformatics methods, we just took an ensemble approach or a consensus network where we um, used a whole bunch of inference methods and we took the network that was actually given or all the edges that were given by all of those. So that doesn't give us the best network that you can get from the data, but the least bad. So at least every, all the techniques agreed on that network. Um, and then we uh, compared that to our literature derived or qualitatively derived network and see how it did. Uh, and we compared that to just a, a randomly derived network. And if we compare our literature derived network with this inferred network, and we use a, a receptor operator curve, um, we actually got this concave shape, meaning that the, um, the similarities between the inferred network and our literature derived network are more than coincidence. Because if it would have been coincidence, we would have been sitting here. So uh, we, had, uh, we had a better fit than uh, randomly would have been the case. Um, if we then use our literature-derived network as a prior for the inference of the networks, we can get this uh, area under the curve up to a quite high value. So that is one way to validate. It's not an absolute validation, but it gives some more uh, confidence in that what we are doing um, seems to be working. We've also taken this model and expanded it with uh, different pathways so that it no longer is only valid for the growth plate, but also for osteoarthritis, so for, for uh, the stable cartilage phenotype, um, and we're exploring in that direction as well. So that was for the cells. If we then look at the carriers, um, we will go from the endochondral part to the intramembranous ossification for a bit. So we take calcium phosphate-based carriers, which are also, which is a track in the lab. And the question then is, if we put our stem cells on these uh, uh, scaffolds, what happens to the cells? What happens to the whole thing in vivo when we implant it? We know that it's degrading, but it's quite hard to control. 
And what the influence is of the release of these, uh, for instance, calcium ions from these scaffolds on the cells uh, is something that, that we need to quantify or that we want to quantify. Here we had uh, quite a lot of data from, a screen, from screening experiments that we had in the lab. So basically, um, the MO of those experiments are we take a calcium phosphate uh, either with or without collagen scaffold that is used in the clinics. Uh, we do our own analysis because the data sheet that you get from the suppliers aren't always so reliable. So we do our own uh, materials uh, characterization. A lot of it is done using uh, CT analysis. Um, and then we combine it with our cells. We implant it on the back of newt mice because our cells are human cells. Uh, and then after an, a certain time, we take it out again and we analyze it you, looking at gene protein expression, but also at uh, morphology um, in, in the nanocity. What we can do with the nanocity, this is just a small example. Here you see a whole mount skeletal staining. We can recreate that using our nanocity where we have specific contrast agents that will, in this case, negatively stain uh, the cartilage. This was hexabricks, and so you see that there is, you can make out the bone and the cartilage uh, very well in this uh, developing mouse. So these things have now, this technology has been validated, so we use that instead of histology, because it does go quite a bit faster than histology, and it gives you a 3D uh, image of, of the, the tissues developing in the scaffold. So what is the set of data we had in the end? Uh, we had, uh, so all the pre-implantation data of the scaffolds, we had three-day explants, 12-day explants, the gene expression and the protein data for those because there is no bone to be seen then. And at eight weeks, we knew uh, the amount of bone that was forming. Here you see a series of five scaffolds. This is, we usually cut them in uh, cylinders of three millimeter by three millimeter. That's what you see here, a section. And you see here in the white, those are the calcium phosphate grains. In the gray, you see the new bone uh, that is forming inside those scaffolds. So basically then we tried to see what in all of this pre-implantation data or three and 12 uh, day data is representative of the eight week data. Just a very quick test. Um, we used a, a partial uh, least square regression. It's linear, so it's by no means uh, very accurate, but it, was, it could be a first uh, test for ourselves. So we saw that actually the data at day three, so if you implant it for three days and then you take it out, uh, and you analyze it at looking at uh, uh, the, the phosphorylation that of the, the BMP uh, pathway ma mainly, the BMP and the wind pathways, well, then you could be able to say something predictive of the amount of bone formed at eight weeks. Now, this seemed very, very simple. Um, we tested a number of other uh, scaffolds, also calcium phosphate based, and for most of them, they seem to be within um, the, the predictive range. There was one that was completely off, uh, and I was actually happy for that because this was the only one where there was no collagen present. So this clearly indicated to my experimental collaborators that there is a limit to what these uh, simple models actually can do, that you need to put in a bit more intelligence if you want to have uh, a model that is valid for a wider range of uh, scaffolds. So uh, the model that we are now currently developing to have a bit more intelligence in there is a uh, model. Well, it has two components. One, we need to have a model that will simulate the dissolution of uh, calcium, for instance, from these scaffolds. And then we need to have a model that will uh, look at the effect of the biology uh, of this calcium ions on the biology. The way uh, we do the, the dissolution of the calcium is using a level set method that was already commented on yesterday during the uh, imaging uh, talks. So what you see here in white are the calcium phosphate grains. Um, and in the colors, you will see the calcium, the local calcium concentration as the calcium phosphate grains are dissolving. Um, this is something that you cannot measure uh, at the moment, these local calci cal calcium concentrations. And they are interesting because, well, this is where the cells are actually are. The only thing that you can do in vitro are these the solution experiments where you take a whole scaffold, you put it in a in, in medium or in, in PBS, and you just you know you measure how much calcium is present in the PBS over time. This is what we did to validate um, the models. So you see over time the calcium release in the in vitro dissolution tests. Um, and so we have uh, 
validated that also using micro CT, uh, nano CT so we can see the degradation of the different grains uh, and, and uh, calibrate our model for that. Now, if we want to link that to the biology, we had a simple model linking uh, calcium ions or the co concentration of calcium to the differentiation of stem cells towards osteoblasts. Uh, you have their proliferation and then the production of non-mineralized uh, bone and mineralized bone. Uh, and of course, there is also the production of growth factors. So that we implemented in the same uh, software framework. And what you get is here three times uh, a similar scaffold, but with different release characteristics of the calcium. And you see that there, it has a profound effect on the formation of bone. So here you see bone is being formed in red close to the grains. Here you see bone in the open spaces in between the grains. And here you see bone surrounding the scaffold. Now, the reason I'm showing this is not because I believe that the model is correct. It is not. But these are the three locations we do see bone formation in reality. But instead of only being dependent on the calcium, it is actually a combination of the BMP that we put on it, so the growth factor and the calcium. So, so we need to change our equations. But it's, uh, I found it hopeful that we had these three types and locations of bone formation uh, with the framework. So one of the ways we are validating this is by uh, having the amount of bone formation and related to the calcium release rate, because that is a, a parameter in the model as well as something that we can measure. So if you put all the scaffolds out in terms of their calcium release rate, we simulated what their bone formation was and we used one calibration point. And then we saw that the other scaffolds that we had on this side were doing well, on this side were doing well, but in between we seem to have missed something, we have a problem. Um, we took an, a bunch of other scaffolds, but unfortunately they were all on the left-hand side. So now we are uh, producing our own scaffolds here somewhere in the interval so that we can check what, uh, what it is that we've been uh, missing in the model. How do we want to use that? Well, ultimately we want to use those scaffolds to determine, uh, or these models to determine optimal scaffolds for each patient. That's a lot to say, but for different patient categories. For old patients, we know that we have very few stem cells that we can get from them. Uh, for younger patients, you might have an abundance uh, of cells. And you see that when you have an abundance of cells that you can put on your scaffold, well, then it really doesn't matter that much which type of scaffold you use because you will get bone formation everywhere, even though there is some optimization that you can do. But if you have very little uh, cells to begin with that have stem cell properties, well, then it really matters what type of scaffold you use and you need to tailor your scaffold for your patient population. So that was uh, the story for the carriers. If we then go to the culture, well, the culture or the bioprocessing bench, as we call it in the lab, what they are doing is actually they're taking the cells, not from the marrow, but actually from the periost. They put it on scaffolds, in this case, titanium scaffolds, because that eliminates all the uh, chain scaffolds that are degrading over time, which makes our study more complex. So in this case, we just settled for a fixed uh, scaffold. Um, and they put it in a perfusion bioreactor system. So this is perfusion and the fluid is being pumped through the system and it's perfused through the scaffold like this. That then can be a construct that we can either harvest the cells from so that we can use the cells uh, and see the monocalcium phosphates or we could just implant it as such. Now the questions we have here is mainly or are mainly to do with quality control. What is going on on the inside of the bioreactor? You don't want to stop your process, take it out, image it every time to look at what is going on. You want to be able to measure what is going on. But the only thing you can access is the medium and some sensors that you can put here at the beginning and there at the end. But that doesn't tell you anything about what is going on inside. So how did we go about trying to develop a model that would answer those questions? Well, we started very simply with a static model, just the cells on the scaffold. And what we saw, um, is that there is this uh, curvature depend whatever scaffold we had in the end if you put the cells on the scaffold you always ended up with these roundish shapes so th they like the corners best so we decided to use um, the curvature controlled cell growth which was something that was put forward in the literature by uh, other groups uh, and to use that as a basis to simulate tissue growth inside our scaffold and we use the level set approach. Again, you have the interface between the new tissue that we will always uh, represent in green and then the empty zone or the free flow zone um, that you have. And the level set is basically the function that tells you how this interface uh, will move. 
And we made that velocity of motion um, dependent on the curvature that you see here. So this is actually the description of the level set. And here you see that the speed uh, of movement or that the movement is dependent on the curvature, on the local curvature. So uh, we calibrated that by using six scaffolds that we had with different shapes. So we had a hexagonal um, a square and a triangu uh, triangular shape in two different uh, sizes. And we used one calibration point. Um, and no kidding, to my surprise, we actually were able to also fit this data, which I had not expected because of this big jump that we saw in the simulations. But apparently this, there, there must be some truth in, in this curvature based growth because it does go from a more square representation to a curvy, to, to a more roundish. And that is uh, explaining uh, the jump that is, that is taking place there. So um, the added value of doing it in a level set, because there were multiple models already in the literature that were doing the same thing using a model of the, of the curvature based growth using the level set method that we had allowed us to do complex shapes. So we didn't have to worry about um, when two surfaces came together, what would happen there. It naturally actually solved the whole scaffold until complete uh, filling. So that is the static part. Uh, we need to enter the flow. The first thing we did is develop a flow model of uh, the bioreactor. And what I show on this slide is actually a bit of an embarrassing example of uh, what a model can do in the lab. For consistency purposes, we always put the scaffold at the bottom of the bioreactor chamber. So this whole thing is the bioreactor chamber. The scaffold is only this high. But well, the first people that started using the bioreactor wanted to make sure that they always would put them at the same location. So they thought, why not put it at the bottom? If you look at this graph, of course, that was a bad idea. But at the time, we just never realized it. We did see that there was an, influ an influence of the entrance. So at the bottom, there was always less tissue than at the top. Um, but then we did actually the calculations using the CFD. And there is a, a critical length, of course, that you, the, after which the flow is reasonably well developed. And you have a more homogeneous situation, which uh, improved our results. As I said, it's quite embarrassing because this is very intuitive. But it took the, the development of the model to actually you know, realize that there was a better choice to make. So um, how do we then simulate the fluid flow? Because we have the free flow zone, but where the neo tissue is, that's a porous medium. So there's also flow through uh, the porous medium. We actually use the combination of Darcy here in the porous part and uh, Stokes equation here in the free flow zone. And we use a kind of penalty method uh, where you had this parameter that would be very high when we wanted to get rid of this uh, influence. Um, and then you would just have the, the Stokes, or this would be actual value of uh, the permeability uh, when we wanted to have uh, the Darcy. From that, we could calculate, based on the flow, we then calculated the shear stresses, both at the interface between the neo tissue and the free flow zone, but also inside um, the neo tissue using a, a number of models uh, that we got from the literature. And what we actually saw is that the wall shear stress, which is often used in tissue engineering as a kind of measure for um, optimizing your scaffold or looking at the influence of, of the flow on the cells, was actually way lower than the shear stress inside the neo tissue, where you also have the cells that will respond to that shear stress. So this is something that we have to reconsider whether we still want to use the wall shear stress or should not transfer to the inside shear stress. So what we now did is we had the static model. We had the influence of the growth of the neo tissue on the flow. Well, we may have to couple back. So we have to look at what is the effect of um, the flow on the growth of the neo tissue. So basically, we, dependent, uh, we made the velocity here. Instead of only depending on the lo local curvature, we also made it dependent on the local shear stress. And because we were added, we added the oxygen tension uh, at the same time. So now the velocity is a function of the curvature, the shear stress. And that was again taken from the literature where we have an optimal region. So that's optimal stimulation. And then you have a zone where it is detrimental. So there is no growth anymore. And oxygen, well, you basically need a certain level of oxygen to have optimal growth of the cells that we have. Again, you see here the chamber, the flow chamber in the bioreactor, the scaffold that we have. 
And then we went, uh, we tested the different uh, situations that we saw in the lab. So we put the scaffold at the bottom and in the middle for a same uh, flow rate. And we indeed saw that there was no uh, tissue developing here at the bottom, whereas you got a more homogeneous filling uh, for the other case. So here you see the, the movies. What you see here is the fluid flow, and it's actually changing, but very little, so you don't see it. And you see here there's no flow, so that there is a minimum, there is some, some tissue growing, and here the flow is simply um, too high to get anything done. When you are in the middle of the scaffold, you see that it's far more uh, homogeneous uh, in, throughout the scaffold. Now you can play around with the flow, which flow is optimal. And what you see here is a very low flow rate is not so very good. And actually, when you have a, such a low flow rate, by the time you reach the upper part of the scaffold, all the oxygen is gone. So you have that problem of, of uh, too little oxygen nutrients at this side of the scaffold because all of it has been consumed by the scaffolds. And also the, the stimulation by the flow is not optimal uh, for that flow rate. Um, so at this point, we're um, extending the model with glucose and lactate, not, not because we like to extend the model and make it as complex as possible, but glucose and lactate are very specifically used in bioprocessing culture, uh, and, and, and cultures, bioreactor cultures, to measure the state of uh, the cell. There are studies that show that by measuring the lactate, you can actually steer um, the process and, and you can say something about the state of the cells and the number of cells that are inside. But obviously this is all some kind of integrated value because this is one lactate value for the entire scaffold. It doesn't tell you anything about the local lactate concentration and cells, they don't care about the global lactate concentration, they care about the local lactate concentration. So that is why uh, we're adding them. So it, it's again, it's the same uh, speed of growth, but now we also added the glucose and the pH uh, into the equation. And we run the simulations on two different scaffolds. You have a gyroid uh, geometry scaffold, and here this is called D-cup. These are triple periodic surfaces. They can be described with a combination of sinuses and cosinuses, so it's easy to model, and we can 3D print them in titanium anyway. Um, so we did the cell uh, growth, and we saw that the gyroid was doing much better um, than the D-cup. And we saw similar results in the, in the simulations, only that we were overestimating still the growth in the D-cup. So here you see uh, the growth, um, sorry, here you see the growth of, uh, of uh, the, so the, the, the filling of the new tissue. There is hardly anything going on in the D-cup, but we were overestimating the lactate uh, uh, production. And that was because we didn't take into account the seeding density. So we just started with a layer of cells and then we had it grow but the seeding density on this cell, was, uh, on this scaffold, was particularly low. So if we adjusted the seeding density, we were uh, getting closer to the experimental values. Now, this seems to more or less calibrate in some way the model. Back to the questions then. So the questions that we had is what happens inside the bioreactor? Can we use it for quality control and for optimization? So what happens inside the bioreactor is that now with the model you can have a view like this. So you can look at, at a particular time during the analysis, what is the local concentration of glucose, lactate, oxygen at different locations in the, in the scaffold. And that will give you an idea at how many cells, how much, what is the percentage of cells that will experience a certain lactate concentration that will have uh, an effect on their proliferative or differentiative capacities afterwards. So you can look at niches in your scaffold, and you could even change your scaffold geometry to uh, optimize uh, these niches. How can you use that for control? What, one of the things that we use in bioreactor control is a pressure drop. So if you see that the pressure drop is going up, we assume that the scaffold is actually filling with the, with the tissue. Now, if you look at the simulation results, you see that by day 10, we're pretty much uh, full. So the scaffold is pretty much full. And it's only at that point in time that we see the pressure drop going up. So pressure drop is not sensitive enough to actually capture these early phases of filling of the scaffold. So if you can combine pressure drop with the model, you can actually be uh, more sensitive in the control of your uh, bioprocess. And in terms of optimization, here you see just a number of designs that we are playing with uh, in silico to look at their effect on uh, the tissue uh, growth, so the filling of the scaffold 
over time under specific cultural conditions and you see that certain scaffolds are behaving really badly and others are uh, way better. So that was for culture. For clinics, it's not so long. I just wanted to show you uh, what we're doing there. It is uh, mostly the questions are looking at adverse fracture healings and, and ways to solve it. This is the result of a long series of, uh, of uh, studies, including my own PhD, where we have developed a partial differential equation model that looks at cells, tissues, growth factors, and individual blood vessels that simulate the fracture healing process. So it's a multi-scale model where we have a tissue level and we have an individual cell level for the blood vessels. What you see here is a difference between a normal fracture and a large defect, where you see that at some point it actually stops the blood vessels stop growing. And correspondingly, also the bone tissue will stop growing after a while. And even after 90 days, there will be a non-union, which is uh, more or less what we see here also in the experiment. So if you take a non-union, um, after eight weeks, you will have in mouse, you will have this capping off. So there will be a bit bone forming, closing off the, the bones, and there will be a large gap. Uh, of course, there is still imperfections that we had in the, if I can go back. This is too much bone that has been formed and we have been able to solve it uh, in the meantime. What actually happens then, why is this happening? You have a drop in the oxygen in the center because the blood vessels aren't there. And then it does go up because the blood vessels keep on growing because they get signals to, to grow into the center of the, because of the hypoxia. But by the time they reach the center and there is sufficient oxygen in the center, all the cells that were there have died because they cannot be, even the chondrocytes cannot be without oxygen for that long. So one of the things that we are now trying out is develop these uh, oxygen releasing particles that we could put in a scaffold or that we could inject into the fracture site which could keep the oxygen at a certain minimal level. So these are uh, beads that would release uh, oxygen. And using the model, we've actually come up with values saying, okay, if you have at least a certain percentage of oxygen or so many beads, you should be able to cover that first, um, that first period and you should get full healing. So we're actually now at the stage where we're testing the release of the beads uh, and then we can implant them. With this fracture healing model, we've done a lot of things. We've looked at mechanical loading, we've looked at different uh, injection of stem cells at different uh, times and places. So we're getting fairly confident that there must be something that is right about this model because we can do so many things with it without really changing it. Um, and I just wanted to come back to my first slide with this. Um, with the neurofibromatosis, we took the model and we adapted it for the neurofibromatosis case where from the literature, there were like eight factors that were changing dramatically in these cells affected by neurofibromatosis, and we adapted them in the model. Now, the problem is this is a very rare disease. There is no way of getting these parameter values. So we were left with just a purely academic exercise where we used a, a design of experiments approach. We decided to go for 200 combinations of these eight parameters, somewhere between hugely affected and normal. Um, and then just run the simulations and see if we could recapitulate the, 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 the clinical observations. So what you see here is for two of the parameters, 200 dots uh, representing the combinations that we tested. But we use an eight dimensional space. So the eight parameters were varied all at the same time. So what you get then here is for a result for one of the specific parameters, you see the evolution between zero, so completely bad and the normal situation. And you see that you have uh, non-union because a high value for this complexity index is a combination of a non-union and a lot of fibroblasts present, which is indicative of neurofibromatosis. So a non-union for the entire range and unions only from a certain value onwards. So you need a minimum, minimal level of this parameter in order to have, healing, uh, to, to have healing possible. If you wait longer, so instead of three weeks, which is normal enough in, mouse, in mice to have healing, if we wait five weeks, you do see that a number of these dots are dropping, so you get healing for lower values, but it takes a longer time. So what we see is that there is a wide variety. You get anything from complete non-union to union, but a lot of fibrous tissue, so very prone to uh, refracture. Now, we don't know how to link this to patient characteristics, so that is still an open question, but since we were doing the modeling, 
we extended it just a little bit by uh, adding a BMP treatment, which is what is uh, often used in the patient. So we took those same 200 patients and we gave them a BMP treatment, the growth factor treatment. And these are the results. So what you have here is the complexity index without BMP. So these are the non-healing patients. These are all the healing patients that we had before. If you give them the BMP, we look at how this complexity index changes. So if it goes up, the situation is now better. If it stays zero, the situation is the same. And if it is negative, the situation is worse. So for the, these are the non-healing patients which have a, a high difference. So they are actually improved by the BMP treatment. These is a group of non-responders. So they had a non-union, but they don't respond to BMP, which is something we do see in the literature or we know from, not in the literature, we know from clinical experience that BMP treatment doesn't work with all of the patients, but we don't know why. But we do see the same pop uh, this population popping up in, this, in, the, in the experiments. We also have um, the group that were healing before and they do not respond to BMP, which is a, a good thing. Um, but we seem to have not so many of them, but a fourth category, which were healing before, but if you add BMP, you make it worse, which is possible because BMP is not an undivided success. It triggers certain pathways, and if it just is triggering the pathway that was too much affected by the NF1, it can cause an adverse effect. So how we are, now we have to somehow come up with, with some kind of justification for this, and this is really tricky because you will never know what happens to a patient when they receive a BMP treatment, what would have happened if they didn't have that BMP treatment? That's only something you can do in in silico and not in reality. So we're kind of struggling with that, but I just wanted to show you because it is, it, it still gives some, some interesting uh, insights, I think. Now to wrap up, um, what we did is we used modeling along our tissue engineering pipeline. Uh, we mainly use it as quality control, but as all models, it can help in the three R's and in personalization. And um, I just had two more, a few more slides asking the question whether this is utopia or reality. It's not just um, that we have things like the VPH, so groups that are working on this, so you're not alone. It's also the FDA, and Blanca already mentioned it. FDA actually allows now models to be used as part of a preclinical dossier. And finally, finally, we actually got EMA to agree to also do that. So that is a good evolution and that will mean that companies will also be more interested in developing uh, these models. FDA is actually a step ahead of us and they already have this set of guidelines. Uh, what if you use a CFD model, what do you need to have in your preclinical dossier uh, to be able to admit it to FDA? So that is also an interesting document um, to look at. And then finally, I know it doesn't mean much maybe, but if industry is getting involved, it must mean that we're onto something uh, that it might someday become a uh, really uh, reality. So that's it for me. I would like to thank all the, the people that uh, whose work I've shown here, and that's mostly the underlined people, my funding sources and you for your attention. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz, for this great talk. So questions? Yes. There is evidence in the literature that non-steroid uh, uh, analgetic therapies are uh, reducing the bone formation uh, process. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, if you are planning to design these scaffolds, and this will be implemented in, during uh, surgeries, uh, it will be, I think, a very important aspect to, to, to show this effect or somehow to simulate and calculate, because these patients will receive after the surgery a large amount of uh, non-steroid uh, energetic ther therapies. So but maybe from clinical side, it has to be a change. But at far today, this is the mm -hmm. first uh, line of drugs that the patients are receiving. Yeah, you're absolutely right that this inflammation is, is critical and it's something we have not looked at, neither in our models nor in our um, animal models actually, because we're using newt mice, as I said, because we have human cells. We see that if we use mouse cells in wild type mice, we already have an, an, a problem with the inflammation response due to the scaffold. So if you then add that to patients, uh, 
that that have a problem in, in that area as well, it, it, it's not so guaranteed that it will be an undivided success. We didn't see any problems with anti-inflammatory with inflammation in, in our large animal studies, but if we then go to patients which have problems with the inflammation or which receive uh, these anti-inflammatory drugs, we don't know at this point what the effect is. So perhaps modeling that, that would be good. But we start from right after the inflammation phase at this point. Any more questions? Yes, Bob? Maybe a bit more a political question. It's like when you look at all the things that you're doing, so you have these gene networks, you do computational flow, you do experimental stuff, you do like, like bioreactors. It's like... If you want to do research in this field, where do you go? Do you go to mechanical engineering? <laughs> do you go to biology? Do you go to medicine? What's your experience? It's a very good question. Um, maybe I should enlighten my complicated uh, affiliation system. In Leuven, I'm affiliated to mechanical engineering because they have a biomechanics division. But if I'm there physically, I'm in the hospital. And I run the, the wet lab for the my colleague who is a clinician, so he doesn't have time to run the wet lab, so I'm responsible for that. So I'm not paid to do that, but I'm, I'm still there. But that gives me, you know, an access and, and some very tiny level of control over, over uh, experimental work as well. In Liège, my education is affiliated to the uh, mechanical engineering department for the Master of Biomedical Engineering, but my research is affiliated to the interfaculty um, group for well, novel technologies in, in uh, biomedicine, let's say. So I am kind of in between a lot of chairs. And I don't know if the affiliation is, is necessarily the biggest problem, but it is somehow translated in the way most funding institutes work. And, and that is my bigger problem, that when I go to typical engineering panels with my research, they will say, yeah, you know, I, don't really can I cannot really judge this, but I don't think it's original. That, that's literally a quote that I got in one of my evaluations. Um, so I have more problems uh, in that direction. I was lucky enough to have an ERC in an engineering panel, but they really try to be aware of the interdisciplinary aspect and, and make sure that they don't penalize it. But locally, I've not been so very successful. <laughs> but partially related to that first is like, locally when you see that you're in a place and then maybe you get some colleagues that say like, um, maybe this is not the most interesting for a department. What, what, what's your reaction then? You say like, no, you're gonna fight for your position or you say like, look, I mean, let me look for people which are more open to things and do that in a way and go there. Um, it's about the people, really. If you, um, I'm not like, like James yesterday, he's hiring all of them. I also hire biologists, but I still feel more comfortable if I have a colleague that is a biologist that, that is uh, looking over my shoulder. So for me, I, ha I need to have these people that I collaborate with. And I've been lucky enough to land in a, part in a department in Liège where they were interested in me because they didn't know anything about this research. So that, that was fine. So they don't not to say that they don't care what I do, but they know that what I'm doing is something that they don't know much about. And that's why they hired me. So in that sense, I was lucky. I would say if you're in a department where they don't really see the value of what you're doing, and you're not in a position to change that, I think it's better to go look for people who do see the value of what you're doing and, and, and try your luck there. So it's a matter to really look for groups and places that are interested in what you're doing rather than what they already do or like how things are going. So, I was convinced of, of that I wanted to do modeling in biology and I wanted to have a close link to the biologists. And when at some point in one of my departments I was at, they said, well, this doesn't interest us. Well, then I knew enough. I couldn't stay there. In the end, when you're successful, they might change their mind anyway, but it takes some time. But so that's important, I think, also for the younger students is like, Really, if you believe in what you do, you will find a place where mm -hmm. they appreciate it. But you have to look for it. You have to go actively. And often you have to change place in order to do that. So, but this is really, really important. Maybe another thing, since we have quite a, long, uh, uh, a lot of young researchers here. So you also, as a reasonably young researcher, you have an ERC. Mm -hmm. Which is, of course, the thing that in Europe is, I think, the thing that everybody should try to do, at least in order to be at the, 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 the front edge of research. 
Maybe you can say, especially specifically for this type of research and the modeling, what do you think is your approach to get successful in applications there? Um, so that would be successful in applications for ERC because I've gone with the same research to regional funding and that, that has not <laughs> worked all, I think always, ERC but is with important. ERC. Um, I just, what I proposed was really the program that I wanted to do. And, and the thing with ERC is they like high risk, high gain. Um, so I just, you know, proposed something that I would not propose to an engineering panel regularly, but in this case it was products and process engineering, but I still came with half of my grant, which is mostly experimental. So it's half modeling, half experimental. And what they did ask me in my interview at the panel was, okay, what experiments are you going to do? What they are for? So they wanted to see if that was really me who had written everything and that I was able to explain everything. But after that, they then only asked questions about the engineering part. But at least they, they, were, they, they realized that this combination for, for biomedical engineering was absolutely necessary. So for me, that, that was the interesting thing with the ERC, that I could just have a program that was a bit bigger than just one PhD student or one company or, or something like that. Just really, if I could choose what, do that, what did I want to do, well, that was the thing that I presented there. But especially if you, you propose a project which is like partially computational, partially mechanics, partially experimental, how do you convince reviewers that you're able to do these experiments? Because, I mean, you have a different background or mm -hmm. did you already prove that you could do the experiment? Or, I mean, how did you convince them? Practically, my, my f this, this ERC, I, um, I had an additional participant. So, um, it's a two-institute ERC, so I had in Leuven, I had Prometheus Group, and I, I, uh, specific, I, I indicated that I would be collaborating for the experimental parts with, with uh, Frank Leut, who is my colleague in Leuven, um, and he has experience in those kind of things. At the same time, I also showed, by means of publications where I was co-author, that I had been involved in experimental research. And in the, the second one that I applied for, that I will have to defend soon in, in September, I did the same thing, only now I made myself the external collaborator or the, the, the additional participant in Leuven. So I, I took responsibility for both the experimental and the, and the modeling part. And um, by arguing that I've been more and more and more involved in the experimental part and that now I would know enough uh, to be able to supervise it myself in collaboration with others. But you explicitly said that you were at two places. So yes. one place with this background, one place with yes. that background. So that's maybe also an interesting message for some of you that are trying because it might be tricky and that's some of the experiments of, of other people that we know is that you say like in one place, okay, that place has knowledge in that, but this collaboration, maybe if you do it more explicit, saying, okay, I'm affiliated with both, then might yeah. indeed... But it's important helpful. to show that you're in control because that was also a question I got the first time. If you have this additional participant and he's world-renowned in a certain field, how are you going to become a leader in your own grant? So you need to show that you are a leader. That's what they're, they're looking for, apparently. So you need to give them arguments as to why you uh, would be able to do that. And that's very important. And it doesn't need to be just science. It can be anything. Like if you're involved in, in, in your, your uh, scientific groups or whatever, you're organizing things, you're taking the lead somewhere, it doesn't need to be just the number of papers that you've published. So there's a, a lot of ways to show that you are maturing and that, that you're becoming a leader. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes, I, I have one. Uh, so, so you've been you've been working a lot in uh, tissue engineering. So nowadays, many people question uh, the, the the real value of tissue engineering and in even research in tissue engineering because. It costs, uh, it costs a lot of money, it's mm -hmm. unaffordable for um, most of the companies, and um, the results after several decades of trials, the results are still at the yeah. beginning, huh? still incipient, and there is nothing, nothing, nothing really, really powerful. So could you already have, through your collaboration, a, a, a clue, a guess on how your modeling work can either uh, shorten, the sh shorten the time of, uh, of studies or the cost of studies in order to, in order to progress towards successful strategy? At this point, the closest we are there, um, 
to answer the last part is with the bioprocessing. So I think um, if we want to make it somehow viable and, and robust, because there's, well, let me start. There are two problems amongst others in tissue engineering. One is the, the cost, which is huge. And the other one is that the, the, the treatments are very much not robust. So what you, it's a lot of manual uh, interventions. If you go to a, a cell, um, a, a, a company that is producing these cells, basically it's just, you know, a wet lab. You, you have a flow cabinet and that's it. So they're still doing everything by themselves. There's no technology there. So I think by entering technology, um, and all the things that we've built up in terms of knowledge of um, in pharmaceutical production, in, in chemical engineering, we would be able to reduce um, some of the costs and increase the robustness. And I think, I think that that would be a big step forward. And there, in order to have good control algorithms for the bioprocesses, these type of models that I showed uh, can help. Um, in another way, um, there is the definition of medical, uh, unmet medical needs. I think tissue engineering solutions are so expensive, you shouldn't use them for everybody, at least not the allogeneic approach. You should really have an unmet medical need for which there is no treatment, which can justify the slightly higher cost uh, in that sense. Um, so these, these would be some elements of an answer. Maybe your last question since uh, we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, do you think, do you, do you, be, do you believe uh, that uh, in silico results can contribute to, to kill uh, a paradigm? So for example, you were showing results uh, on BNP and indeed it was not that nice uh, in terms of uh, clinical, uh, in terms of, of clinical safety. And, and actually in the clinical world, uh, BNP are more and more uh, criticized but when you look into research, it's still a very strong target of research. People keep on trying using BNP in order to treat patients. So do, do you think that in silico, uh, in silico simulations can influence on, on the shift from one paradigm uh, to another? Um, I would say that it might help in identifying the patients for which you would want to use BMP and for which you don't want to use BMP. At this point, the simulations that we did, there's too little data. So we need to do a lot more simulations if we want to be able to assess why in this fourth category of patients that I showed, it has adverse effects. If we would know what kind of advert, what, what causes these adverse effects, and if we would be able, which is a big if, to trace that back to patient characteristics, we would be able to do a patient triage basically and say, okay, with this profile of patients, you would be helped with BMP, but this profile of patients, we need to be careful. So not killing a paradigm, but being more careful in where and when to apply one or the other, I would say. But what is your power of influence? The power of influence? Well, I think um, that companies uh, have every interest now in, in, in uh, being precise about the patients. They know that blockbusters are dead. That's, that's something that everybody knows. So they know that they have to go to more careful uh, identification of, of patient groups. So if you can show that, well, they are becoming interested in modeling, also in the pharmaceutical industry. But yeah, the power depends on, again, if you have a good collaboration with the company if you can convince them that you're serious about your data, if you have some data, some, some experiments to back it up, I think if you have a good package and a good result, they will listen to you because it's in their best interest. Okay, so more big companies than silicon. Well, since we are not producing the BMP, so. <laughs> well, I think it will be the even to regulation and healthcare yes. because the companies, they're not happy not to give drugs to people. They try to give it to as many as possible because of course that's where their money comes from. But as you said, trying to go to personalized medicine will be more important. But I think it's much more healthcare and costs yeah. that will put that, like cost efficiency. That's so true. I think that's quite important. Okay, um, I think that was it for today, for this morning. Um, as yesterday, we will start with the practical sessions again in the same places, starting from around 2.30. And additionally, today is our day of our kind of social event which would be like a beer tasting, will take place here in the courtyard starting from 6.37.